Hello, this is Jeff Lighthall from the Department of Anesthesiology. I'm here to give you a lecture on um, oxygen transport and uptake and how it's moved through the body. Um, I call it the economy of oxygen in the body, um, which I think uh, reminds you that you have to account for both supply and demand of oxygen and um, think about how um, different states that might impact either of those two terms. When you attend this lecture, um, hopefully you'll develop an understanding of the economy of oxygen within the body. You'll think of critical in those in terms of oxygen supply and demand, and you'll learn this so well that you'll be able to teach this material to two other people. So first, let's kind of get into it <clears throat> through a, kind of a typical case. Let's consider a 40-year-old man who's in a motor, motor vehicle crash. He's an unrestrained passenger who um, develops some um, um, blunt trauma. He has facial fractures, he has abdominal bruising and pain, and when you go see him in the ER, he's got a Glasgow Como scale of 15, he's pretty alert-oriented, his blood pressure looks pretty normal, his pulse is elevated, and he's breathing 20, because everybody breathes at 20, and his saturations are 94%, um, this is on room air. And the trauma surgeon is concerned about shock, but in looking at the patient's blood pressure, you know, you just kind of wonder like, well, what's the big deal? The blood pressure is fine. Is this really a case that will develop into shock? So let's take that piece by piece. So is this patient in shock? Well, the definition I use for shock is hemodynamic compromise of the magnitude that will lead to organ dysfunction and possibly death if it's not rapidly corrected. And so there's two physiologic determinants of your, your progression to a shock state. Um, the first is blood pressure, which you probably recognize, and that's a blood pressure that needs to be within the patient's autoregulatory range. And as you know, some people are chronically hypertensive, and so a normal blood pressure for you might be totally abnormal for um, your patient. But the other component that's kind of the one that's a little bit more hidden out of view is a significant mismatch between the supply of oxygen relative to demand. So why do we care about this? Well, if you don't have adequate supply of oxygen in the body, you're not able to yield as much energy as you possibly can. And so in anaerobic metabolism, you get basically two moles of ATP out of every glucose molecule that you metabolize. In contrast to the situation when you have oxygen as an electron acceptor, you're allowed to then um, yield a whole lot more ATP from basic um, carbohydrate metabolism. So that's absolutely key for us being very specialized creatures with um, highly functioned and differentiated organs that require oxygen. We cannot ha hang out in, in an anaerobic mode or else you know, we'll, we lose function and we die. So in considering what it takes to get oxygen to the cell, a few different um, equations and relations are important and these are pretty easy to develop. Um, the first is the content of arterial oxygen in the blood. And um, as you know, this comes in both dissolved um, quantities, and that's related to the PaO2, um, and then there's bound, which is related um, to a constant times this oxygen saturation times the hemoglobin concentration. And that's where most of the oxygen um, lives and how it's carried around. Now that's how much is in, in a certain quantity of, of uh, a blood, of arterial blood. And when you talk about delivery, that really is the relation that you need to know because that's related to metabolism, which is kind of a per minute um, consumption of oxygen. And so if you multiply the content of arterial oxygen times cardiac output, you arrive at oxygen delivery. So thinking about the terms that you have, um, Really, this constant is constant, so that drops out. The saturations, you're a good doctor, so you keep the saturation here at 1.0, so that gets to drop out because that's one. And then this 0 0.031 times PO2 really only counts if you have very low hemoglobin concentrations, um, but really most of the oxygen is in hemoglobin, and so that can be ignored. And so essentially what you have um, for oxygen delivery is the product of hemoglobin times cardiac output. And so that's something that's pretty easy to remember when you um, think about oxygen delivery and how it's getting around the body and what might be the 
and when you see some evidence that oxygen um, is not getting to the body, that's a pretty easy term just to consider. You know, is it one of these two terms there? Because usually it is. So kind of looking at the whole body perspective, um, again, we have um, a kind of an input variable, which is the content of arterial oxygen. You have how much is being consumed, and we call that VO2. And then there's the reserve, which is the mixed venous blood. And when you start to the circulation in motion, these terms change a little bit. So the input becomes delivery, because now not only is there content of arterial oxygen, but you have cardiac output. And then consumption is a per minute consumption. It's not just like liters, but it's liters per minute. And so that becomes V.02. So when you hear that term um, used in this talk and others, you'll kind of know that that's sort of like a dynamic term of consumption. And then you have um, the rate of venous return, which is basically what's left over there. So you're probably familiar with the Fick equation. And this is how um, a this is a um, group of terms that ties this all together. And that's one where if you look at the content of arterial oxygen and you take away the content of venous oxygen um, and you multiply that times cardiac output, essentially that, that AVO2 difference times cardiac output is what your V.O2 is. And there should be a dot there, sorry. This, uh, this font does not come with dots. And you can rearrange this term uh, sometimes to calculate cardiac output if you want. And so cardiac output becomes V.O2 over this difference. And yet another way of looking at it is um, not necessarily deriving the full terms foot for content of arterial oxygen and venous oxygen, but really just looking at the saturations and multiplying that times hemoglobin in 1.34. When you really think about it, there's really one main factor that differentiates arterial versus mixed venous blood and that's the oxyhemoglobin saturation. So I'll move on to this example here and just give you some numbers to illustrate that a little bit further. So let's say that, that you have 100 units of um, oxygen in the arterial circulation, or you can even think about this as the oxyhemoglobin being 100% saturated. Um, a quarter of that which is delivered, let's say is consumed, call it 25, and what's left over for mixed venous O2 blood is 75% of what started out leaving the left heart. And so if you think about these, um, the arterial and the venous side in terms of saturations, and you really can't do that for the V.O2, what you see is that um, basically three quarters of the blood that left the heart came back unused. And so, and that becomes um, the value of looking at mixed venous O2 saturation or the saturation in venous blood. Because if, if consumption is occurring at a constant level and you have decreases in supply, then what that'll show up as is more extraction relative to that oxygen supply. Or if metabolism goes up, you'll have more extraction relative to the oxygen supply and that will show up as a change in your um, oxyhemoglobin saturation of blood. Um, so just a real quick term here. Um, so normally mixed venous O2 saturation is about um, 70 to 75%. Uh, strictly speaking, mixed venous O2 saturation is a saturation of blood in the distal pulmonary artery just before it gets reloaded at the pulmonary capillary alveolar, alveoli interface. Um, we don't have PA catheters in most of our patients. And so caval O2 saturation is a pretty good approximation. And really the only difference is the contribution of coronary sinus blood into the right atrium. And that throws off the concentration a little bit because generally the coronary circulation tends to over extract oxygen from blood relative to the systemic circulation. So you might have a caval saturation of 75% and a distal pulmonary artery saturation of about 70%. But as long as you're using the same value from the same, or the same source to give you your values as you trend them over time, it's totally valid, it's no big deal. And for the purpose of this talk, and sometimes clinically, we sometimes throw out mixed venous O2 saturation, even though we know darn well we don't have a pulmonary catheter. So, a little digression there. Okay, so here's the normal situation once again. And so let's consider what happens when you exercise. Well, what happens is 
you basically recruit um, extra blood from your splanchnic circulation. There might be some capillary fluid shifts and your cardiac output goes up because your heart rate goes up and your stroke volume is going up. And so you have, say, 200 units um, delivered and because your metabolism is higher, you're gonna get extract as much. And then when you look at what's left over in the mixed venous blood, it's going to also be, um, it's also going to reflect um, kind of the higher demand and, and the higher um, supply, but the saturation is still going to be about the same. And, um, and so again, there's no pathology going on there at all. Basically, your body is accommodated to, dis to have all this reserve capacity where you can increase your cardiac output and you can increase your V.O2 in a very flexible manner, and they match these, themselves incredibly well. And it's pretty rare that you're going to really have any kind of problem with getting enough oxygen to the cells. So let's take a situation where the mixed venous O2 saturation is, is dropping, and where, you, where it's not normal. So let's consider anemia here. So when you have anemia, you're going to have a lower content of arterial oxygen, but if you have that, but if you have less DO2, but your metabolism is the same and you have the same activity level, what's going to happen is you're going to extract more oxygen per hemoglobin molecule than you did when you had a normal complement of red cells or a normal complement of hemoglobin in the body. And so your mixed venous O2 saturation is going to show up as being lower. Well, what happens when you have a lower cardiac output? So if you're kind of shrinking on this axis, again, your DO2 is going to be less. But if your oxygen metabolism is about the same, then what's left over is going to be a lower saturation of, of mixed venous blood. And again, you're going to have a lower mixed venous O2 sat. And then how about in hypermetabolism, which you don't see that much in the ICU, but um, things that would affect metabolism are things like high muscle mass, a lot of activity, maybe somebody who's you know in four point restraints, withdrawing from PCP, who's just like fighting, um, fighting you uncontrollably, and just metabolizing tons of oxygen, using tons of muscle strength, um, fevers, MH. Those are some things that can lead to hypermetabolism, and so if you have higher V.O2 in the setting of the same or similar supply, then what you, you're going to have left over again is a lower mixed venous O2 saturation. So what's the clinical use of mixed venous O2 saturation? Um, well, if you have a new patient and you're just taking a survey of their end organs and looking at oxygen metabolism and you get a low level, say something lower than 55%, um, even 60%, well, that gets, gets your attention and will make you look deeper at, you know, what are the determinants of supply and demand that might be amiss? Is this patient anemic? Do they have a very low cardiac output? Or for some reason, are they over-extracting oxygen from the blood? Um, other application is in the setting of serial measurements, especially when the activity level of the patient is the same, like they're paralyzed, sedated in bed, or just sedated or hanging out in bed. Uh, and if the hemoglobin is the same and the heart rate's the same and the heart's adequately filled, then a change in mixed venous O2 saturation, in this case a lowering mixed venous O2 saturation, will indicate that there's a change in heart function and contractility. And in fact, sometimes this is a tip-off that someone is developing a septic cardiomyopathy when you have the heart properly filled and there's not any bleeding and there's not any you know, um, change in uh, activity level or metabolism. So hence, all of your determinants of V.O2 and DO2 are totally the same except for um, stroke volume. And that, again, can kind of point to you the heart as a culprit. And it's used very um, extensively in that setting. Um, for example, you might have someone that you are weaning from a dobutamine infusion that they've been on for several days and you're trying to increase afterload and really ask yourself, hey, does this patient really need all this dobutamine? And as you back off of the dobutamine, you can look at mixed venous O2 saturations and see whether that really falls off precipitously as you lower your dobutamine, hence indicating whether you have enough forward flow.
Um, and also, you know, in a patient when you do have a normal hematocrit and say what you consider normal metabolism, just, you know, again, kind of a spot value will help you zero in on cardiac output as being um, a problem. So I'd like to present another view of oxygen supply and demand. I'm going to draw a curve that relates the relationship between supply and demand. And so on the y-axis, we'll put V.02. And um, as you might know from the earlier part of the discussion, V.02 is really dictated by behavior and your whole me metabolic milieu. So if you have a lot of muscle mass, you're going to consume more oxygen. If you're febrile, active, running, restraint, um, et cetera, um, you're going to be consuming a whole lot more. In contrast, if you're paralyzed, sedated, intubated, cold, um, critically ill with um, you know, myopathy, you're not going to be consuming as much. And so in some way, that's kind of an independent factor that's dictated by um, behavior and body composition. But at the same time, you can your V.02 might be dependent on oxygen delivery if it's critically low. And so what I'm going to do here is just basically draw out a few tick marks that indicate um, increments of liters per minute. Let's just say that this is one liters per minute. And the scale is going to be the same on both of these axes. And this is V.02. V and this is oxygen delivery here. So let's say that the body is demanding one liter of oxygen currently. And so the amount um, of extraction is going to be dependent on delivery. And so if the body is delivering only half a liter, then the body is only going to consume half a liter. If the body delivers a liter of oxygen, then it'll consume a liter. And if the body starts delivering multiples of liters, like one, one and a half, two, three, four, etc., well, the body will be able to consume what it wants, and it won't be limited by oxygen delivery. And so there are a couple key parts on this graph, and this is known as the supply-dependent region, where your ability to metabolize oxygen is dependent on supply, and this is the supply-independent um, region here. Um, and as you might imagine, the human body or, you know, the animal body is designed to live way out here. So you can have all sorts of things happen to you that compromise oxygen delivery, sending you down here in a leftward direction. But you have to be in a pretty low oxygen delivery state at a very critical lo low, critically low level, um, really before your body gets into trouble. But when it does, if your body is demanding say one liter of oxygen and you're only getting half a liter, then this um, can be regarded, you know, parts of this region can be regarded as an oxygen debt, which is the gap between what's desired and what is actually supplied. And when you have an oxygen debt, you're not capable of aerobic metabolism and instead you're yielding that two mol moles of ATP per glucose rather than the 34, 36, uh, whatever it was. And so your cells are going to be damaged. You're going to have to either hibernate or you're, they're going to experience overt necrosis. And that, you know, this is the region here that defines whether you're in a shock state, um, being down in this dangerously low part of the curve. Um, as you can imagine, you know, obviously your, your body is V.02 um, is changing all the time, unless you're a critically ill patient chained to a bed. And so you're always, you know, you know basically, 35 minutes of your, you know, living is going to be like basically generating a whole bunch of different V.02, DO2 curves. And really most of the time you're going to be way out there in fat city where um, your body can increase cardiac output according to increased demand. You'll be, you know, there'll be plenty of oxygen delivered. You're not going to have any limitation. Um, the exceptions are some forms of extreme exercise like you know, the Olympics coming up next month, you'll see people doing the 50 meter freestyle where they just put their head down and grind out 50 meters without taking a breath. Um, and their, their cells will be hurting, their arms will be hurting at the end of that sprint um, because there will be kind of a brief auction debt where there's a lot of lactate that's been produced. But with a good liver and a good blood flow, that'll soon turn into um, regular carbon skeletons and be metabolized pretty readily.
So how do you know that you're down in this zone here? I mean, that's certainly the important part of evaluating somebody that's in shock and really any kind of stigmata of anaerobic metabolism um, is, can be inferred to be you know, consistent with you being in that part of the curve. So things like high lactates, um, metabolic acidosis, um, low pHs, um, anion gaps. These are the kind of things that you see when you have low oxygen delivery, plus end organ dysfunction. But if you have, um, I mean, really, though, you don't really have too many dynamic changes of end organ function except for the brain. So you do see in patients when they have cardiogenic shock and very low outputs, they're totally vasoconstricted, there's no blood flow. Um, they're, they're having mental status changes. They're just like combative, unfocused. You know, you can't get a straight answer out of them. They're just like writhing all around because there's no, you know, hardly any blood going to the brain. And you can see that in real time. Um, however, lack of blood flow to liver, kidneys, splenic circulation, um, you know, other internal organs, you're not going to see that in, um, in real time as you will with the brain. Um, if the heart's particularly vulnerable, you might see myocardial ischemia and ST changes, but really those are kind of, you know, the exceptions. Instead, um, you're relying on looking at trends of things like creatinine transaminases, um, you know, maybe some signs of GI dysmotility. So those are kind of longer term. And so really what we're trying to do is like kind of look at the global supply of oxygen is really the first indication of determining whether you're in trouble or not. We don't wait hours for the creatinines to rise. Um, and so these are really kind of some of the big evaluation keys that, you, that you'll see used clinically when people are worried about patients in shock. So I cleaned up the whiteboard a little bit to redraw this curve uh, to answer another question, and that is, well, where does mixed venous O2SAT appear on this curve? And um, as mentioned before, if you have a constant V.O2, and um, so that's you know not changing, someone's pretty sedated, then really mixed venous O2 saturation changes as you move up and down this curve as, I, as I'm drawing there. And so a decrease in mixed venous O2 sat means you're draw, going from the right side to the left, and as you increase, you go left to the right. There's a um, formal derivation that's really not too complicated that describes this too. And that is if you take V.O2 over DO2, and that's the O2 extraction ratio. And you subtract that from one, you're going to get your mixed venous O2 set. So give an example, let's just say you're demanding one liter per minute um, there, you're delivering say three liters a minute there. And so this is kind of where you're living out here in a very happy zone. So um, V.02 is going to be one, it's going to be over three. So that's 0.3, one minus um, one minus 0 0.3 um, is going to be 70. And so that's a 70% mixed venous O2 saturation. And so, can you use mixed venous O2 saturation as you can some of the things like lactate anion gap and some of the stigmata of anaerobic metabolism? It becomes a little tricky, but if you see your mixed venous O2 sat going from 70, 60, 50, and it's just starting to plummet out of control, you know that you've got a situation that um, is pretty undesirable and you got to do something about. But is there a, a single number that is really pathologic? Um, and I think most would agree that when you get below um, a mixed venous O2 saturation of 50%, you have to start to worry. Some of the um, assumption that, that a mixed venous O2 saturation less than 50% is detrimental comes from just you know, a lot of clinicians pooling their experience. But another way of looking at it is if you um, actually assume an oxygen uh, V.02 of one liter and you um, play with different oxygen delivery values and you calculate oxygen extraction ratios from those from the V.02 and DO2, and then you um, compare that to the mixed venous O2 saturation, um, you can see that 
here, you know, if you go out from five, four, three, two, one, as that ox oxygen delivery decreases, um, you know, over, you know, multiple liters um, per minute, you get kind of a slow decline in your mixed venous oxygen saturation. And then when you, by the time you get to 50%, um, smaller changes in oxygen delivery can really plummet the availability of oxygen in your body. And that can, you know, you can see that there's a whole different limb of that curve that changes right around there. And I, so I think that's kind of um, probably a numerical way of understanding that there's a little bit of an inflection point where you just, your ability to tolerate small fluctuations in um, small changes in cardiac output or, or hemoglobin um, concentration, things that make up oxygen delivery, could very well um, decrease quite a bit the amount of oxygen that's actually available um, to the cells and what your reserve capacity is. So, you know, getting back to just the overall context of why we care about mixed venous O2 saturation, VDOT O2 um, to the economy of oxygen in the, in the blood, is that relationship that we're talking about in, in this particular lecture is absolutely key in understanding um, patients and the evaluation of patients that have um, clinical conditions that can either be characterized as shock states or that will progress to shock states rather quickly. So again, um, being down in this part here, um, the low part of the autoregulatory curve, that will define you as having a shock state. And again, some patients have right shifted curves. And being down in this oxygen um, dependent region of the V.O2 DO2 curve will um, define you as someone who's in a shock state. And so if you think about cardiogenic shock, those are patients who are down here in this region of the V.O2 DO2 curve. Uh, many times patients can still compensate from cardiac, uh, cardiogenic shock. They liberate tons of catecholamines, and so they can have blood pressures that are just right on the precipice, but still perhaps in the normal range of that patient. But in terms of movement of blood throughout the body, it's an absolute disaster. Um, hemorrhagic shock will have a huge decrease in hemoglobin content, which is also um, a big constituent of, of preload. And so you get kind of a double hit in so many patients in cardiogenic shock, um, like the one in, in the case that we're considering in this lecture, will, you know, can be living down here in anaerobic land, but still have an adequate blood pressure because their vasomotor system works perfectly well and they can um, they can use catechols and various other constrictors to compensate for the decrease in blood volume. Although their, their end organs are not being fooled, their end organs are in dire, dire straits. The distributive shock um, pictures are usually those that are associated with low blood pressure because the vasomotor system does not work. Their vasculature is poisoned, they have all sorts of cytokines and upregulation of um, nitric oxide synthase and desensitization of catechol receptors, and they just cannot maintain a blood pressure, um, despite the fact that the cardiac output might be sky high. And so you might be living on this part of the curve here um, in really bad case of distributive shock like pancreatitis and septic shock, but you just you don't have the ability to maintain a blood pressure, and so the end organs are experiencing that part. So back to the trauma victim that was discussed in this case. Um, so this patient who had a reasonable blood pressure is now appearing uh, more and more cold. He's now disoriented, combative. He was on face mask O2, but he keeps knocking it off. Saturations are hard to measure. Um, part of its behavior, a huge part is because the patient's probably horrifically vasoconstricted and there's probably not much blood flow going to his fingers. And then when you decide to look under the hood and really ask, hey, how is V.O2, DO2, what's that relationship like in this patient? Um, it's revealed here with this terrible metabolic acidosis, 708, 21, 152, and a base excess of negative 12, which correlates pretty closely with lactates and hemorrhagic shock. And so this patient is um, experiencing anaerobic metabolism and all of his end organs are um, targets for rapid demise if there's nothing that's you know, going on with, the, there's no corrective action that's gonna take place pretty quickly. And a lot of times the crits, even though the patient's lost a lot of blood, they, a lot of their blood loss initially is isovolemic, fluid shifts haven't happened, IV bags haven't been hung, and so the crits 
Um, they look semi sort of acceptable, but when you start to um, hydrate this patient or allow them to become euvolemic, um, that will plummet very quickly. So these are some um, additional resources for studying and enjoyment. Um, this is a very influential um, clinical trial from the early 2000s on the um, uh, therapy and evaluation of patients with severe sepsis and septic shock. And so if you read that paper, not so much for what the details are and, um, you know, the order of, the, of what they did and the fact that they created um, an improved survival, but if you look at it in terms of how did they enroll patients, you know, how do we beat out O2, DO2 in autoregulation of blood pressure? How do those play out in enrollment um, criteria? How do those factors play out in the goals that they try to reach? And you have to get to them quickly, and that's really kind of what that trial showed, is if you know what your goals are and you get organized and you can reach them uh, rapidly, you'll, you'll create survivors. So um, read that article with, with these factors in mind, and I think you'll kind of see another dimension of what's going on with that as well as any other trial that tries to improve the survival of severe sepsis and septic shock. Um, this is a paper that's kind of a review of what we talked about here in part. Um, and then also, you know, you can look at some of the def definitions for sepsis and septic shock in terms of um, blood pressure and responsiveness to fluids and what that means as far as categorizing the severity of septic shock and um, a number of other educational videos and critical care um, outside of this series that you're watching right now can be found at this particular website here as well. So thanks for tuning in.